note to our panelists, perhaps uh, turn off your uh, your mic if you're if you're not on. I just went to a talk that uh, was given by a really thoughtful speaker who who uh, <laughs> said that uh, he uh, he had. Um, had been on a been on a mic, given a major talk with lots of people around, and uh, left the microphone on while he went to the John. <laughs> and came back, and the audience was looking at him. He said, "That's not the noise that you want to hear." So uh, we'll, we'll turn our we'll turn our with that uh, with that uh, classy introduction. My name is Mike Vandenberg. <laughs> I'm a professor of law and um, uh, co-director of the uh, Energy Environment and. Uh, a land use program with uh, J.B. Rule, who is here. Thank you, J.B. And uh, most importantly, for our purposes here, I uh, am the co-professor for the Environmental Law and Professor uh, Policy Annual Review uh, with Linda Bregan. And uh, I just want to say a word about what we try to accomplish with LPAR, as we call it. We're really excited to have Eric here today and our panelists. We have a terrific uh, panel for you. They will be introduced in just a moment. But I just want to say a word about what we're trying to do because it's something that is unique in the original sense of the term. Unique doesn't mean uh, a little bit better or different. It means truly one of a kind. And that's what LPAR is. Why is it that? We're doing three things. One, we are trying to take the very best academic ideas and put them in a format where they can move easily into the policy world. Uh, Linda and I were both um, in administration jobs years ago in D.C., and neither one of us had the time to read the 400 footnotes that seems to be the minimum requirement for a law review. And what we're trying to do here is, is take the best ideas we can find in the academy, simplify them, uh, put them in a short format, and then get them into the public realm. This is one of the ways we do that. The other way we do that, in addition to the publication itself, is by having a conference on Capitol Hill, which we'll have uh, in about a month March or so. March 22nd. So if anyone will be uh, in D.C., we'll have a, a room, a hearing room on Capitol Hill and we'll present uh, other papers there. The second thing we try to do is, um, is to try to improve the quality of theoretical scholarship. So, uh, so one of the things that happens in, in the academy is if you write a paper with policy implications, your colleagues will tell you uh, to take it out. Uh, it's too simple, too basic. It won't place in the best journal. Uh, and as a result, you can... Um, Riff, I guess, would be the modern term for it. You can riff about whatever really cool theory, theoretical idea you have, and you don't have the grounding of having to apply it to a particular policy. You can assume a can opener uh, when you're trying to open a can. Uh, and so we all do that, which is a really cool thing if you're a professor, but it means uh, really smart people are writing very theoretically sophisticated ideas and not having their feet held to the fire in terms of what the limits and implications are, the constraints in the real policy world. So that's our second idea, is to try to create incentives for people like Eric uh, and others to generate policy pieces that are not just um, pure theory, but a mixture, taking the theory and applying it um, to the policy world in order to make the, uh, the theoretical work better than it otherwise would be. Uh, then the last and most important thing we do is uh, we try to provide a truly unique educational experience for students. Uh, you'll hear more about what LPAR does more specifically, but we're trying to give people an unusual perspective on the uh, academic literature that's out there and the policy implications of that literature. And that's our goal here. And so today is an incredibly important piece of that whole picture. And uh, I hope you'll find the panel to be as interesting as I think uh, we will and that you uh, will read our, Eric's paper and see the quality in it that we did as well. Linda? Thanks, Mike, and welcome on behalf of the Environmental Law Institute. My job today is just to keep us moving along with the program, and so I am going to hand it over to Seamus Kelly, who is a third-year law student and this year's editor-in-chief for LPAR, and he's just going to tell you in a quick couple of minutes about how we pick Professor Bieber's piece out of the hundreds that we looked at. Thank you, Linda, and thank you, everybody, for being here today. Uh, so this is the, <clears throat> sorry, the end result of a lot of work that the 20 members of the LPAR class and their two professors <clears throat> did uh, in order to choose these great articles that Professor Vandenberg was describing. <clears throat> we started with a pool of 152 journals um, and ran a search of any time the word environment was used. So those are the top law reviews. Um, for the top 100 law schools, as well as all environmental journals. Uh, and we ended up logging 770 articles that used environment in the appropriate context. Um, from there, each article was screened by two students to see if it met our specific criteria. Um, 
that Professor Vandenberg described where we're looking for articles that have policy implications um, and again are, are really great environmental ideas. Um, so we had 292 articles that were then distributed amongst the group to really assess what the best ones were. Um, from there, the, the class wrote 164 one-page summaries of all those articles where uh, the first half would be a synopsis and the second half we really tried to assess why we thought it would be a good fit for LPAR. Um, from there, we all selected which summaries we like the best and we discussed 52 articles uh, for selection, which we then finally brought down to a pool of 20 uh, and supplied it to our advisory board who were a lot of environmental law experts throughout the country um, who participated in a conference call with us and helped us to choose the five articles that are gonna be in this year's issue. Um, and we're so excited. Uh, Professor Bieber's article was very popular amongst the students uh, really interesting ideas, and we're so happy he could be here today to share his ideas with us. So, thank you again, everybody, for joining us. And I'll pass it off to Linda again. Great, thanks, Jameis. Um, and I want to introduce now Chip Sherwood, who is going to introduce our terrific panel today, um, who we very much appreciate being here. And Chip is a third year student and is the conference coordinator for LPAR. Thank you. Uh, first of all, we'd just like to thank our speaker and our panelists for being here. We really appreciate you uh, taking the time to join us today. Um, our main presenter today is Professor Eric Bieber. He is a professor of law at UC Berkeley. His research is focused on environmental and natural resources law, administrative law, and property law. Prior to joining the faculty at UC Berkeley in 2006, he worked as a litigator in the Denver Office of Earth Justice which is a public interest nonprofit organization specializing in public lands and other types of environmental cases. He clerked for Judge Carlos Lucero of the 10th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in Denver and Judge Judith Rogers of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. He received a Master's of Environmental Science with a focus in conservation biology from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies and a JD from Yale Law School. Um, our first panelist is Ann Davis. She is the managing attorney for the Nashville office of the Southern Environmental Law Center, a 26-year-old not-for-profit law firm that seeks to protect the South's environment through the power of law. She previously practiced with Bassberry Sims and was a partner at Neil and Harwell. Um, Ms. Davis served as chair of the Mayor's Task Force on Environmental Sustainability and as a member of the Green Ribbon Committee. She and her husband, Mayor Carl Dean, were recipients of the 2011 Tennessee Environmental Council Sustainable Tennessee Award. She's also a graduate of Vanderbilt Law School. Um, our next panelist is Sherry McGreblian, who is the Deputy Commissioner of the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation, where she, where she oversees the department's environmental regulatory programs for the protection of Tennessee's air, land, and water. She previously served as the Environmental Operations Manager at General Motors Plant in Spring Hill, and prior to that worked in various roles at the Spring Hill facility for the Saturn Corporation. She holds a PhD in Environmental Management, a Master's Degree in Engineering, both from Vanderbilt University. Um, our final panelist is Mr. Kevin Warkington, who is the Corporate Environmental Director for Louisiana Pacific Corporation, a building products manufacturing company headquartered in Nashville. He has worked for Louisiana Pacific for 17 years, having begun his career as a plant environmental manager. He has a Bachelor of Science in Biology and Environmental Studies from the University of Winnipeg and a Master of Natural Resources Management from the University of Manitoba. Uh, now we are going to turn the show over to Professor Bieber to, prevent, to present his paper, and then we will hear from the panelists. Thank you. Uh, thanks again for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be here and enjoy the lovely winter weather in the middle of the country. <laughs> so information is essential to the development of environmental law and policy. Information about the quality and status of the water we drink and swim in, the air we breathe and the ecosystems and species we depend upon is essential for upholding our laws, regulations and management decisions, updating those laws, regulations and management decisions, holding regulators and politicians accountable, and in allowing members of the public to make decisions about how to conduct their everyday activities to minimize risks. 
It's also crucial, information is also crucial to the next wave of environmental law and policy ecosystem and adaptive management. A key part of these new paradigms is making environmental law and policy flexible, designed to be updated on a regular basis uh, based on developing new information through management choices and responding on a regular basis uh, through uh, changes into regulatory and management standards. But this necessarily requires good information about the nature and quality of the ambient environment. The problem is monitoring ambient environmental conditions is actually pretty fairly hard to do well. So in order for ambient monitoring, monitoring to be effective, it must be long-term and continuous. You need to measure the right variables. You need to measure those variables at the right temporal and geographic scales. And you need to measure at a level that's adequate to answer your regulatory or management questions with appropriate statistical power. So let me talk about each of those in turn and why they're important. So long-term and continuous monitoring matters because in many cases there's uh, significant, often unknown variability in environmental resources. So for instance, disturbances like hurricanes, fires, droughts, or floods are often important in the condition of environmental resources, but they're unpredictable and infrequent. So missing data can make it difficult for us to assess whether these disturbances occur and how important they are in management and regulatory decisions. Uh, Long-term monitoring is also important because environmental conditions often take a while to change. They often may change slowly. Trends may be slow but steady over time. Uh, it also can be extremely important if we're trying to separate long-term variability, such as annual or decadal cycles in a particular resource, from underlying changes. So for instance, separating out annual and decadal variations in atmospheric CO2 concentrations from human co uh, took decades to get separate those out from human caused changes in CO2 levels. Uh, matching the scale of your monitoring program to the scale of the resource that you're measuring is also an important issue. Uh, here the key question is whether your monitoring, your scale of your monitoring matches the variability of the resource that you're monitoring. Uh, if you monitor at too fine a grain uh, compared to the resource you're monitoring, the signal of your monitoring program may be drowned out by noise. On the other hand, if you monitor at too broad a time or a spatial scale, then you may not get any useful information at all because any changes that are important are not noticed at all in your monitoring system. So for instance, if changes in the resource vary on an annual or monthly basis, then daily monitoring is pretty useless and it's a waste of time and energy. On the other hand, if the resource varies on a daily basis, annual monitoring is going to be very uninformative. So one important lesson to take away from this issue of scale is how difficult it might even be for experts to understand what the scale of variation for a resource might be. Uh, we know actually very little about how many resources vary over time and space and how that variance might interact with the design of a monitoring program. Monitoring programs might not also have the statistical power needed to answer relevant management questions. So here the key question is whether you've collected enough monitoring data, collected enough observations, so that you can reduce the uncertainty of your measures, measurements enough that you have information that's useful for decision making. And all too often monitoring programs don't have enough observations to even provide any useful information at the appropriate levels of statistical significance. And again, as with scale, this could be very difficult for outsiders, even expert outsiders, to understand whether a monitoring program will actually produce useful or effective information. This requires understanding the variability of the resource in question, uh, statistical techniques and tools, and the details of monitoring program. And in fact, scientists regularly uh, get this wrong, even in their own studies. If monitoring has to be long-term, continuous, well-managed to the resource that you're measuring in time and space, it's also often going to be quite costly, and monitoring budgets are limited. So let me connect these features of monitoring to the legal and institutional obstacles that might exist, exist for effective monitoring by public agencies. So first, a monitoring program might be vulnerable to political pressure, where information might be produced that is threatening to important interest groups. So again, it takes significant technical expertise and investment often to determine whether a monitoring program is effective. You also will need to assess that monitoring program over time. And again, that requires continuous supervision. So which political groups are more likely to be able to organize to develop both that kind of expertise and maintain supervision of monitoring programs over extended periods of time? Uh, generally speaking, groups that are easier to organize will have an easier time of collecting those resources and maintaining them. 
And generally speaking, regulated parties will be better able to organize themselves in this way because they tend to be fewer in number than the general public that benefits from regulatory programs. And the stakes uh, for each individual regulated party tend to be higher than the stakes for each individual member of the public. Also because usually the default is no regulation unless you can establish that there is a problem with an environmental resource. Uh, failure to produce useful information or monitoring program will usually result in no regulation at all. So you can see how that requirement might lead to an underinvestment in effective monitoring programs, but the production of a whole lot of ineffective monitoring programs. A second major political or legal constraint for many monitoring programs is budgetary, a lack of resources to conduct an effective monitoring program. Now this is also a political program, but it's a different kind of political program. Uh, the reason here that we may not have enough funding is not because monitoring programs are too politically irrelevant, but because they're perceived as politically irrelevant. What I mean is that uh, monitoring may receive too little investment because it's not obvious how monitoring might improve management in the future. This is particularly true because monitoring may take many years to produce useful results. The political process, however, might be impatient for results today. Another problem might be that public agencies, like all human institutions, have a natural tendency to avoid criticism. Monitoring data might reveal flaws or challenges with how an agency is performing its tasks. And so agencies might necessarily or naturally be a little skeptical of developing effective monitoring programs that might result in negative political or legal feedback. Uh, this problem can be exacerbated because most public agencies, including environmental agencies, are tasked with pursuing multiple goals, and those goals will often conflict with each other. Monitoring ambient environmental conditions might conflict with an agency's accomplishment of other goals. Another general rule for most public agencies, again, like all human institutions, is they seek to reduce the political and legal constraints that they face. And again, if monitoring is unpredictable in terms of outcomes over time, information might produce constraints in the future on what an agency can do that are uncertain or unknowable. And that might be something that agencies might wish to avoid at times. Finally, many environmental agencies have a significant number of scientists who do their environmental science and research or even management in many cases. And scientists would seem to be an obvious uh, candidate to conduct monitoring. The problem is that in general, professionally, scientists are not rewarded for conducting ambient environmental monitoring. So what kinds of solutions might we try to uh, look at to address some of these obstacles? So a commonly proposed solution is interagency collaboration, uh, having multiple agencies pool their monitoring data and resources together to get better outcomes. And there could be a lot of places where this can be useful. But one thing to keep in mind is agencies generally will only collaborate to the extent that it is in their own interest to do so. And if you believe what I've just said, there may be a lot of circumstances where agencies, consciously or not, may not have an interest in collaboration. Another alternative might be passing a bunch of laws to require agencies to conduct monitoring and have courts enforce those laws against agencies if they persist in pursuing ineffective monitoring. The problem here is, one, courts don't like this kind of job for them. They see this as ongoing interference with day-to-day -day agency management. And even more importantly, if even expert scientists have problems assessing the quality of monitoring programs, it's hard to imagine that lawyer judges will do much better at this job. So I don't think mandatory duties or court enforcement are, in general, the most promising remedy, although they might be better than nothing if that's all we have. Another alternative is to look to citizen groups. So one example of this are bucket brigades, which monitor air pollution from industrial facilities in residential near neighborhoods near those facilities using crude uh, techniques. Um, citizen groups, however, may not have the resources to obtain or run more sophisticated technological monitoring programs that we might need to assess certain resources. They may not have the training to do certain kinds of uh, monitoring. And there may be a suspicion from the government or the public about biases that citizen groups might have that might affect the outcomes that they produce, the research they produce. Uh, perhaps most importantly, it's rare to find a citizens group that can stay in existence for the many, many years that you often might need to compile a good monitoring record for many environmental resources. So uh, the final option, the one I think has the most promise, or at least is worth exploring in much more detail, is a way to restructure public agencies, <coughs> to take advantage of the institutional continuity that public agencies have, but reduce the obstacles that they might face uh, to pursue adequate ambient environmental monitoring. So one possibility here is to split up the task of monitoring from the other tasks that our agencies might have to pursue. 
This would reduce the risk that conflicts between goals, between environmental monitoring and other agency goals, might interfere with environmental monitoring. Also, if monitoring is the primary or sole activity that the agency is pursuing, then it will be much less likely to cut the budget for monitoring disproportionately, since that would be institutional suicide. And in fact, the agency will also have a strong institutional incentive to fight for monitoring budgets from the legislature. There are, however, of course, uh, trade-offs here and risks to splitting off monitoring from other actions. An important one is that coordination between monitoring and management decision making is often important to effective monitoring. And increasing the institutional separation between monitoring and management might decrease the effectiveness of monitoring and its use in decision making. So how might we balance between the benefits of a separate agency and reducing coordination problems? One possibility is that for certain kinds of agencies and certain kinds of problems, separate agencies are more useful. So for instance, development agencies might be more likely to have conflicts between conducting monitoring and the other activities that they pursue than regulatory agencies. Uh, similarly, coordination might be more important for monitoring programs that focus on particular management goals where the monitoring program has to be specially crafted to assess whether the management goals have been achieved, as opposed to uniform environmental regulatory standards where careful tailoring to particular circumstances is much less important. So one final uh, just a specific example I want to point to of a potentially successful monitoring agency is the U.S. Geological Survey. It has a long history of doing research in natural resources, but it has also expanded recently into doing a lot of monitoring for both federal and state agencies. Uh, there are a lot of advantages to USGS. Uh, like I said, it does a lot of monitoring, and there, it doesn't have any management or regulatory responsibilities that might otherwise conflict with USGS's monitoring role. Uh, the two main issues that USGS might face in the future is one, it has been historically dominated by <coughs> scientists, and it usually pitches itself as a science agency. So there's a risk that the internal culture of the agency will de-emphasize monitoring. At least in its public materials, USGS seems to recognize this risk and seems to be trying to guard <laughs> against it. The other concern is a risk of institutional separation between USGS and the management and regulatory agencies it might work with. Uh, again, this, which is, this will require coordination. USGS seems to be aware of this, at least to some extent, and is trying to address it. Uh, like I said, USGS is not necessarily the solution or a solution, and it may not work well in the end. But what I think is important is it's striking how little attention that this question of, while well, politics, law, and institutional frameworks affect whether and how we produce useful monitoring information, it's gotten almost no attention, not just in the scholarly literature, but also in the debates among managers and scientists on the ground who are thinking about monitoring. And I think this is a fundamental question that we need to consider and, and develop a better understanding about if we're going to move into the brave new world of adaptive ecosystem management. Thank you, Sherry. Do you want to? Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to start just with some overall comments. Um, Professor Beaver presents an overarching challenge that we already face um, as environmental regulators and professionals, even within current regulatory frameworks. The article proposes that the importance of environmental monitoring and discusses how best to achieve effective monitoring under a new paradigm of adaptive management whereby environmental regulatory management and policy making is continually evolving to meet uh, changing environmental conditions and circumstances. He discusses current challenges with ambient monitoring, the need for long-term and continuous monitoring programs that are designed to answer the right questions and are cost-effective. The author also does a nice job of summarizing not only the importance of these critical elements of environmental monitoring, but also where um, we are currently challenged with meeting these elements. In addition, he also covers the numerous constraints, both external and internal, agencies must deal with to conduct effective monitoring programs. One of these rings particularly true for environmental agencies, and that is budget constraints. Uh, this constraint often leads to others particularly pitting extensive environmental monitoring against other agency priorities such as meeting mandated requirements to issue permits, inspect facilities, and etc. As the author points out, environmental resources have a tremendous amount of variability and function at different rates and scales. 
Our impact on those resources is oftentimes complex, uncertain, and sometimes unknown. Monitoring these resources over time is, as you can guess, time-consuming, complex, and very expensive. Unfortunately, these two things are likely to remain constant. Natural resources and the environment in general are not going to get any less complex, and state and federal agency budgets are not likely to get larger. So with these practical realities in mind, my comments will focus on the two points that the author makes in the article. One, more effective monitoring is needed, particularly with ecosystem and adaptive management strategies. And then number two, that separate dedicated monitoring agencies may be the best solution to developing effective monitoring programs. So with respect to proposition number one, more effective monitoring is needed. As an environmental professional who works at the agency tasked with ensuring the protection of the, and improvement of the air, water, and land resources in Tennessee, I do not fundamentally disagree with this proposition. However, I question whether it is realistic and more importantly whether it is actually necessary to reach environmental goals. More data, better information, different kinds of statistics and facts is always desired and will always be seen as being better than what we have to work with today. The monitoring programs we implement today are certainly not perfect, but they do produce a lot of good data. In fact, it is current monitoring programs like the NAAQS program under the Clean Air Act and the Water Quality Monitoring Program under the Clean Water Act that have helped us better understand that non-point source pollution dominates the impairment of waters in the United States today and mobile sources contribute significantly to non-attainment areas across the country. So while not perfect, current monitoring programs do provide us with a lot of useful information. Additionally, regulatory agencies receive a significant amount of data from the regulated community. This is in the form of compliance monitoring and while may not necessarily be designed to answer the right questions from an environmental policy perspective, it can be useful in providing snapshots of localized natural resource health and there may be opportunities to explore expanding this monitoring to provide better overall indicators of human, uh, of natural resource health. The reality is that monitoring, by whomever it is done, is complex and costs lots of money. Therefore, it is highly likely the monitoring will not always be long-term, continuous, or as unbiased and transparent as we would ideally like it to be. So could there be improvements in these areas? Yes, absolutely. But as we set priorities to make environmental management and policy decisions that reflect and are reactive to what is happening within the ecosystem, the watershed, or whatever level you determine is relevant and important, I believe that we must practically start by asking two basic questions. Number one, how much information, for example, environmental monitoring data, is necessary and effective to make a good decision? And then number two, do we already gather that information and can we compile and access the information in an effective way that allows us to draw conclusions and make decisions? I believe there's a significant amount of monitoring data or the potential within our current programs to develop data that is both sufficiently effective and readily available to use in environmental management and policy making. We have federal and state agencies across Tennessee that all care about and monitor water quality. For example, the department I work for, Department of Environment and Conservation, Tennessee Valley Authority, USGS, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency and etc. Additionally, we have regulated entities all over the state that are required to conduct compliance monitoring that at least provides the potential for a snapshot of water quality at various locations throughout the state. So our challenge is not producing more monitoring data or even more effective monitoring data. Our challenge is to find better ways to share monitoring data, establish coordinated goals for monitoring programs, and to foster public acceptance of such shared data such that it can effectively use, be used to make decisions and set environmental policy strategies.
Having the technical vehicle through which to effectively compile, share, and evaluate environmental monitoring results and a mandate to do so would be a great first start. More importantly, it would put this extensive, critical information at the fingertips of management and regulatory agencies that can most effectively and efficiently utilize the information to implement the changes necessary to accomplish broader, long-term goals under an adaptive management scheme. And then with response to proposition number two, which is that separate dedicated monitoring agencies are needed to develop effective monitoring programs. In order to pursue more effective environmental monitoring, the author proposes to restructure agencies to create dedicated monitoring agencies that may be less constrained and conflicted than agencies that have a combination of management or regulatory and monitoring roles. While this proposition may address some of the internal constraints the author discusses in the article, it will not address the external constraints summarized in the article. As the author points out, even if the agency is a standalone agency with its own single focused monitoring budget, that budget will be subject to external judgment on the relevancy of the agency's work and how that work is perceived by elected officials and the public. Additionally, as a public agency, courts are highly likely to give that agency the same level of deference regulatory and management agencies receive within their area of expertise. In creating a separate monitoring agency, a couple of critical consequences will follow that I'm particularly concerned about. Number one, we will have separated ready access to both the data and those best knowledgeable about the data from those that make decisions based upon the data. Number two, we will, through the bureaucracy of government, have created an inevitable time lag between when the monitoring agency actually collects the data and when it will be ready for use by the management or regulatory agency. And three, we will have separated the critical information from the regulatory and management decisions and strategies that will be made based on such information which will likely necessitate public inquiry to two different agencies if individuals, groups, courts, elected officials, etc., want to access and evaluate the underlying data that informed agency decision making. So in conclusion, the author does a very thorough job of evaluating both the importance of and challenges with environmental monitoring. This leads to the author's assumption that current monitoring programs are not effective and must be made effective to meet environmental goals. While I definitely agree that more meaningful, effective monitoring should always be a goal of regulatory and management agencies, I believe that our larger and, more, and potentially more rewarding challenge lies in coordinating, sharing, and assimilating current monitoring data across all public agencies in a way that allows universal use of such data to make decisions and set strategies that will help achieve environmental goals. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, yeah, this, this turned on, it turned on, it's good. Um, so this is an area that is really important in our work. Um, the Southern Environmental Law Center does work in six southern states, um, Virginia, Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Alabama. And we do it um, across the board in different areas. We've got a coastal and wetlands program, an air and energy program, land and transportation, um, mountains and forests and water and then kind of a special place is kind of a catch-all. Um, so we've got 53 lawyers in these six southern states. So some limited resources, right? Where do we put um, our work? And our work, um, the direction of our work, our strat the direction, the goals that we set and the strategies that we use are all based on monitoring. Um, so for example, um, our air and energy team is focused on shutting down outdated coal-fired power plants. Um, why is that the goal of these lawyers in the, these six southern states? Well, we know from monitoring that our six states, these six states, if they were a country, would be the seventh largest emitters of greenhouse gas in the world. So, huge problem here that is identified by monitoring. Um, so um, that information, that, that monitoring information, dictates a broad goal for our organization. But monitoring also dictates the selection of individual strategies to accomplish that goal. Um, for example, uh, part of our air and energy work in putting pressure on coal-fired power plants is to look at what's happening with coal ash. 
And so coal ash um, has, uh, there are a number of problems with coal ash and the way it's stored now. Um, there can be catastrophic failures like there was at Kingston with the TVA um, coal ash. But there can also be just leaching of chemicals from these coal ash ponds because the coal ash is stored right on the waterways and the chemicals can leach into the water. Um, so for example, um, we discovered through some of our partner, some of our partner groups came to us and were concerned about coal ash um, in, at the Colbert power plant in Atlanta, TVA power plant. And we discovered uh, through some monitoring reports and through some independent testing that yes, it appeared that uh, chemicals were leaching into the river. And so we have just sent um, TVA a 60 day notice of intent to sue under the Clean Water Act. So there, from monitoring to not only our broad goal, but di dictating our strategies. Um, so, and, and as we open our new office in Tennessee, which has been open for a little over a year, um, we are looking at where are the problems in Tennessee? Where do we put our resources here? And the real way we determine that is through whatever information we can get about the quality of the water, the quality of the air, uh, what's going on with the forest. Um, so monitoring will dictate our future directions and, and the lack of information. So sometimes there's information we can look at that we say there's a problem here. And whether that's um, information that's uh, submitted by industry to the agencies or information that TDEC, for example, is collecting itself, um, we can look at that to dictate the direction. But sometimes there's not any information or not much information. And so one example of that is the issue that's been uh, prevalent in the news pretty much all over about fracking for natural gas. And we've gotten involved a little bit in that and um, are kind of thinking how much further do we want to get involved. Um, Tennessee has passed some regulations that are now waiting for approval from the Attorney General. And at the same time, University of Tennessee is proposing to frack on some publicly owned land in the Cumberland Forest. Um, well, there's no systematic, and Sherry, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I don't think there's a systematic program for groundwater monitoring on a broad scale in Tennessee. So, I think that's right. Yeah, not, so um, people, Scott, people from um, environmentalists in other parts of the country think fracking is a real danger to groundwater. Um, and they've seen that in, in some instances. Um, but, you know, we're kind of saying, okay, is it a danger to groundwater? How would we even know? We don't know what the quality of our groundwater is on a broad basis across the state. So, yes, we need, um, we're trying to shut down coal plants, and so we need natural gas, but is fracking as big an issue as people say it is? We've got a different geologic formation here. So if we had information, for example, about the groundwater, the quality of the groundwater, and we're able to do some research and gather that information, we could better determine the direction of our work. Um, so. I guess what I'm saying is I think the ideas from Professor Bieber are really interesting because as a, on a practical level it, it impacts our work and where we put our resources. And I would be one who would say the more information the better. The more information we have the better decision we can make. Um, and I also like the idea of putting it in a separate agency that is only charged with gathering uh, that kind of information. And that's because, as um, Sherry recognized, I mean, there are significant, um, significant budget hurdles at an agency like TDEC. And when you've got all these other things you've got to do, that's a real issue. I went to TDEC's um, hearing in front of the legislature, their budget hearing last week, and they're down 300 employees. That's a lot of people that aren't there anymore, and a lot of work other people have to pick up. So how they do what they do with the staff they have and the budget they have is pretty amazing. Um, so there are budget issues, and maybe there would be budget issues anywhere, but if you could somehow um, structure uh, some agency or some governmental entity so there wouldn't be those budget issues, or there would not be competing factors for that limited amount of money, seems like that would be a great idea. 
I also think if you could have um, an agency that simply was charged with gathering the information, that it would be um, somewhat immune from the political pressures that an agency like TDEC has to feel, whether it's from an administration that wants to be business friendly or whether it's from individual regulated uh, customers or whether it's from the lawyers for those um, individual regulated businesses. Um, the, um, so the, I guess, um, the ability, if, if there could be, if it was feasible to have a separate agency that was funded to do only the monitoring and was uh, kind of immune from those political pressures, I think we would have a lot more and better information that from our point of view could better inform us as we uh, decided what area to go in strategically. All right, thank you. Um, I'm hopefully going to be able to bring an entirely different perspective coming from the regulated industry. Um, specifically for myself, I've worked for 17 years starting as an environmental manager at a facility that operated uh, environmental monitoring programs, air, water, uh, wildlife. And uh, over those 17 years, I've been involved in designing, implementing, uh, managing those programs. <clears throat> Typically, from the regulated side, is done as a condition of a permit or operating license. And so we are then answerable to the regulatory authority in that, in that regard. Um, Louisiana Pacific, uh, Pacific being a forest products company is typically located, we have our facilities located near the resource or normally in a rural environment. Likely one of the only, if not, or one of the only operating uh, or industries in the area, uh, probably the largest if, if there are others. Um, so we've been involved in establishing those monitoring programs often designed to uh, determine if there is an impact uh, from our facility operation on ambient air quality. That's um, in particular where my background is. Um, but also very often to uh, show that there isn't an impact, uh, which is interesting in itself. Um, as I said, usually we are answerable to the regulatory authority in that, in that regard. Uh, all of our experience, so with LP, we've had, we currently have 25 facilities operating in Canada, US, and South America. Uh, we've had up to 75 or 80 facilities at one time. All the ambient monitoring that I'm familiar with is in Canada. We don't do any in the US or, or in South America in a, as a, at all. Uh, in the Canadian regulatory context, the industry is generally responsible for that monitoring. We pay for all the monitoring. We do all the design, implementation. We do that in conjunction with the regulatory agency and with their approval, but we're responsible for managing that and monitoring and submitting reports to the regulatory agency. Um, depending on the jurisdiction we're operating in, they may or may not have expertise in that area, and so they rely on the industry to generate the data. And the one thing that um, all of these programs have in common, regardless of where we are, is that there needs to be a high level of trust between what we do and what the regulatory authority wants. And so to that end, we, we work very closely with them in designing these programs. Um, I do want to point out, I had uh, one when there was one issue in the article uh, suggesting that a lack of monitoring data is likely to benefit industry um, because the, uh, the burden of demonstrating the need for regulation rests with the regulatory agency. My experience is there's a lot of uncertainty and so the regulatory agency tends to over-regulate in that regard. So that may mean additional monitoring for parameters that you wouldn't normally have to do or additional monitoring stations. So I just, there may be a balance there between those two. Um, in an industrial setting, Often, uh, we're not only looking for an impact or lack thereof on an ambient condition, but may also be trying to validate uh, uh, something, uh, an impact that was predicted by a model. And that, in particular, becomes very challenging for any kind of monitoring program because these models are typically run before a facility is built. They're generated based on surrogate data, which would be either uh, emissions data from a similar facility uh, or process, but not necessarily local and meteorological data that may be considered to be representative, but again, it's not local. And so when you're trying to generate monitoring data to confirm a model, um, you will have conditions that are just impossible to recreate in a real environment. So for example, let's, you know, for an air quality dispersion model where you would take, um, try to generate, say, a, a permit limit for, for an emission source. You would generate maximum ground level concentrations based on meteorological data, based on worst case ambient or pardon me, worst case emissions um, from the facility. Um, but 
in reality, if you establish a monitoring program to try to capture that, you're likely not going to be able to do that because the meteor you're looking at a very, very specific set of circumstances where you might be looking for an event that happens less than 1% of the time, a uh, meteorological event, and you'll be looking for maximum emissions at the exact same time. So you're going to have a very, 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 very rare event to try to capture that. Um, the other thing is uh, Dr. Bieber, or me, Professor Bieber addressed the issue of continuity. Actual monitoring program may or may not be able to replicate that. It depends on the parameters you're looking for. If something like ambient particulate, you can do uh, continuous monitoring for. Other parameters, you can't. And so you're trying to capture, again, this goes back to monitoring versus modeling. You're trying to capture a specific event. You may not be able to do that just by the inherent nature of the method. Um, let's see. Finally, I just wanted to add that uh, whether, uh, well, a modeling program will take background conditions into account. In reality, those may be entirely possible to take out of the monitoring data that you collect. For example, if you locate uh, a manufacturing facility in an area dominated by agricultural activity, your ambient particulate is going to be 99% related to the agricultural activity. You'd never be able to specifically identify what the, the uh, contribution of that facility is. So you may have a monitoring program that's well-designed, robust, has addresses all of the potential issues uh, or uh, potential issues that Professor Bieber has identified and yet would be criticized because it can't capture what it may have been designed to capture if you're looking to validate a model. Um, I thought overall I, uh, there were a lot of good points in the article. I thought um, the contribution of industry in terms of our, envir our, our knowledge of environmental considerations relevant to our operations, our familiarity and experience with local issues, uh, local environment, um, there, could have, there, there should be a partnership there between industry and government. It, uh, our knowledge is invaluable in the design of a program that, uh, or any kind of environmental monitoring program. Specifically for a forest-based company, we have a vested interest in the sustainability of the resource. Uh, we also work and live in those communities, so we we're, have we're vested interest in air quality. As such, you know, we find that our most uh, effective environmental monitoring programs are based on some kind of a broad stakeholder advisory committee or cons consultation committee. Um, where all stakeholders are represented. Uh, the design then requires a long-term commitment by industry, by government, by local partners to ensure that uh, we agree on priorities and have the funding uh, and the parameters in place for, to ensure long-term success of that program, uh, but can also adapt to changing values or priorities over time. So ultimately, I'd say that there is no perfect solution. We're looking for the, the best available solution. That's, in my mind, that's a balance of interests, a balance of priorities. Um, my experience is that can be best achieved through a collaboration of all the partners involved and all stakeholders then would buy into the process and ensure that a program would be implemented and maintained for long term and limit any inefficiencies uh, and ensure long term success of that program. Thank you. Thank you for your excellent comments. We are remarkably ahead of schedule, which never happens. Um, Eric, would you like to take a few minutes and respond yes. to what you heard? I, I, I noticed that you were writing Lots of seriously. Yes. So let me first respond to Kevin's point about corporate monitoring. And uh, this gets to a distinction I draw early in the paper between uh, what I call compliance monitoring and ambient monitoring. So as Kevin notes, there's actually, uh, academics have noticed this as well, but in practice, a lot of corporations do monitor their own environmental performance, both for regulatory reasons, but also for non-regulatory reasons, that because of stake, uh, shareholder pressure, community stakeholder pressure, because of marketing reasons, a desire to project a certain image in the market, or uh, the owners of the company, if it's a private company, might have other goals besides simply maximizing revenue. Uh, so there are a lot of reasons why companies might monitor their own performance. The question is, how well will they monitor the, the impact of the overall ambient environment? And this is where the problem is often a mismatch between the scale of the company's impacts on the environment and the overall environment as a whole. So to take an example, uh, if there's only one facility with oh, effluent uh, into a lake, it makes sense for the company to monitor the quality of the lake because there's a direct or a relatively direct correlation between the effluent of the facility and the quality of the lake. Now, we can complicate that. So first, you might say there might be other natural causes for good or bad water quality in the lake. And the more of those alternative causes exist, 
the harder it is for the company to show that the ambient conditions of the lake, whether good or bad, are the result of our actions. Uh, you might have bad ambient quality and the company's doing great on effluent and it can't show it because the lake is being harmed by other natural factors. And the flip side might occur as well, right? The company might have terrible effluent, but it turns out that the lake's doing well because it, there's other natural factors that are causing the effluent to be uh, dealt with. Now, it gets even more complicated if there's multiple human actors that affect a system. So if there's 10 facilities discharging into the lake, monitoring that ambient quality of the lake becomes a lot less, makes a lot less sense for any one individual company. If you show the lake is doing well, that redounds to the benefit of all the facilities. You're providing a public good in terms of information. If the lake's doing bad, right, then that might be because you're, not because of what you're doing, but because of all the other, the other parties that are all bad actors, right? So you're better off just measuring what's coming out of your tailpipe than what the lake as a whole happens and how it's doing. So you can see that this really depends on how well the, the scale of the company's impacts or the institution actor's impacts reflect on the scale of the overall problem that you're trying to measure. Now, for a company like Louisiana Pacific that tends to have large land, larger land holdings, this makes more sense. You see more compliance might make uh, more the compliance monitoring blurs more towards ambient monitoring in, in many circumstances, although not all, right? So you mentioned that it's important for the company, for the forest product system to be sustainable and to deal with what air quality because you might have pressure from local communities. But there's other resources that aren't as essential both to long-term wood production or necessarily to the individual members of the local community, such as, for instance, protection of endangered species in the area. The only pressure on that, uh, at least in a hard sense, other than wanting to be good citizens, is going to be from a regulatory system. So there'll be less internal need to do uh, measurement on those resources as well. But anyway, the point is generally just to make the note that there are reasons why companies will not, even the best intentioned companies, will not necessarily have strong incentives to, to measure ambient resources. And so this is one of the reasons that most of the ambient data, at least in the United States, that's collected is collected by public agencies. Now, you mentioned the context of Canada that the public agencies require the companies to do the ambient monitoring data for them. And that uh, can be a definitely an option. And I didn't mention in the talk, I briefly talk about in the paper, the problem or the challenge with that, not a problem, the challenge with that is you're just replicating the same problem but another level. So if all the dynamics that I've talked about might exist on agencies monitoring directly would equally apply to an agency monitoring the monitoring by an industry uh, partner, right? So just as we might be concerned that there might be pressures against the agency doing the monitoring itself, there's going to be similar pressures about the agency doing a good job of supervising monitoring by the corporate partner. <clears throat> so uh, I, uh, those are the main points I think I wanted to tackle uh, talking about Kevin's comments. Uh, and let me just jump in. I know that some of you have class, so oh. know, when you need to leave, leave. Um, and I know you need to actually teach class. But we'll just keep going okay. and just try to ignore I'll, I'll be movement. brief. It's not uh, personal. So I, I, I'd like... No, no, don't be brief. Okay, okay. We have well, of time. We so let me move on to Sherry's comments, because again, I think they were very helpful and I, very thoughtful, and I want to talk a little bit in response to them. So the first question is, do we... Uh, I, I take her as saying, first, Maybe we don't need more information. And there's two ways of doing that. One is that the information we have is good enough as it is, or good as it is. And uh, you mentioned specifically water quality. And one of the issues on the water quality is the most recent EPA report that I have the data on here is we only have good data on 19% of river and stream miles in the United States for water quality and 37% of lake, pond, and reservoir acres. So that's a lot that we don't have any data on at all, or at least any reported data that we do say, right? So then there's a separate question, which I think is more what you're going at is, is the data good enough? Are the, is it, are the benefits we get from doing better, collecting better information, outweighed by the cost? And that's an, a difficult and important question. I think one of the challenges there is, if it's so hard to assess how good monitoring is, then it's that also quite difficult to do a fine-grained cost-benefit analysis of whether more monitoring is worth it. And if that's the case, then really what we're left with is saying, Maybe we're better off trying to make sure we design the institutions such that we're comfortable they'll produce good quality information uh, rather than trying to carefully parse whether each individual bit of monitoring data is good and good enough. And that's one of the reasons I push more towards these solutions that focus on structures of how agencies assess and collect the information and produce it 
because if you trust the structures to generally give good incentives for people to produce useful information, then I think we're more likely to get good outcomes than if we try to ex post carefully assess do we have the best monitoring data we could and is it worth getting more monitoring data or not. But it is an important question about the cost benefit one and it's, necessa it's a necessary one of course. Um, the other main point I think I, I, I took from your comments about whether our monitoring data is good enough is we have a bunch of data we're not using it. And I think that's very much an important question and in fairness I've been working on that question since this project so there's no reason you guys would know anything about this. But I think uh, many of the same problems come up there as well, right? So you might be equally faced with problems about not having the resources to, to use the data or process the data because that's again seen as, well we're not sure that's going to really produce any useful information now. We need to keep doing that on an ongoing basis as the data comes in so we can be reactive. Um, so again, that's, uh, I think uh, the, some of the similar problems come up there as well. So it's likewise, uh, sharing data, I agree, can make a lot of difference. It can mean that we can do things at lower costs. It means that we can uh, take data at different scales to help answer important questions we otherwise wouldn't be able to answer. But why would agencies want to share the data? Uh, why, what incentives would they have to want to share the data across institutional borders? Uh, if they don't want to do the data work themselves, why would working with other partners be appealing to them? And again, there may be reasons to that, or good answers for that, but that's a question that you still need to answer in order to get agencies to work together. Um, in terms of the uh, external uh, pro politics uh, or the external constraints on creating separate agencies, I agree with all the comments you made. So the budget dynamics may be tough such that even a separate agency can't get a good budget. These are all solutions on the margin, as it were. So the idea would be, that TDEC has to fight for both an for an enforcement budget, for a regulatory revision budget, for a permit processing budget, for an education and public relations budget, and for a monitoring budget. And within the agency, there's going to be, and from the groups that the agency works with, there's going to be different pressures to protect each of those different budget components. And, you know, on average, regulated industry is going to want the permit provision budget, the permit processing budget, to be protected because they don't want to have to sit for two years waiting for a permit. And so they're going to be willing to cut back on the monitoring budget. They're not going to fight for it in the legislature, right? So the question would be, if you can get a separate agency whose institutional structure depends on monitoring, institutional survival depends on monitoring, that can provide on the margins some extra protection for monitoring budgets. But again, it's not a perfect solution. There are no perfect solutions in this context. In terms of the coordination, I completely agree. And I think it, it's going to really depend on the particular context of whether a separate agency on the whole is a better choice. I do think actually for regulatory agencies, you could make a good case that separation is less useful uh, because I think in general regulatory agencies probably have better incentives to collect the information. Then for instance, if you think of the classic example, and this is unfair to the Army Corps because they're not like this anymore, but if you think of the Army Corps in the 1960s, right, they saw their job as building dams. Well, are they gonna wanna collect good information saying that this is not a good place to build a dam? No, right? That's not going to help advance what the agency's mission is. So they're probably not going to do a good job of collecting that kind of information. So again, it's going to be context dependent and I very much agree with that. Um, so I think those, I'll stop there. I mean, I had some other points, but I've gone on long enough and I'm, maybe more of it can come out in the Q&A, so. Um, do any of you have anything else you want to say before we turn it over to questions? Is there a rebuttal? Mm -hmm. Is there a rebuttal? <laughs> no? All right, do we have any questions in the audience? Professor Bieber, I was just, so in the context of an independent monitor, I feel that you're still going to run up against the issue of having to make decisions about priorities, what to monitor, where to monitor, how to monitor. Mm -hmm. And depending on the mandate you give such an agency, there's going to there's gonna remain those competing incentives within the agency to pull one way or another. Do you see any sort yeah. of way around that or yeah. we just kind of? So that's an excellent question. And uh, I, you know, uh, what you could in theory do is, um, I mean, you could try then separate monitoring programs. Do you think they really conflict with each other? 
Uh, that, however, to some extent just pushes the problem up, right? So then the legislature has to decide among the different agencies how to fund them. I don't know if that makes it any better. And we're also multiplying you know, costs of, you know, there may be diseconomies, uh, economies of scale, and so we're, we're eliminating those by having lots of little monitoring agencies. And the, the transparency thing that Sherry brought up is a, an important one as well. The more agencies create, the more complex the system gets. It's just harder for people to know the general public to know what's going on and who's doing what. And there's also um, small monitoring agencies are also vulnerable. So they tend to not have a lot of clients. They tend to not have a lot of stakeholders out there fighting for them. And so they're easily eliminated. So there's actually a story out of this out of the Pacific Northwest. There's an agency, believe it or not, uh, not believe it or not, it's actually really important in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, their primary job is to assess how many salmon make it down and back the Colombian Snake Rivers through the hydroelectric systems every year uh, because this is a huge issue for the managing the hydroelectric system in the Pacific Northwest. It's called the Fish Passage Center. It's primarily funded by the Bonneville Power Authority, which is the major electricity provider and distributor in the Northwest. It's a federal <coughs> agency. Well, the Fish Pass the center got in trouble because it started issuing reports saying, well, we see, we see more flows over the dams in the Snake River. That means we see more survival rates for the juvenile salmon going down the river. And that was interpreted as supporting uh, environmental plaintiffs' litigation challenging the operation of those dams and perhaps even politically supporting the removal of these. There's four dams in the Lower Snake River that have been very controversial for decades. And so this, I believe uh, it was uh, Senator Craig, if I remember, maybe it's Senator Craig, I'm not sure which, out of Idaho, uh, I, the, where they get the benefit from uh, the Primarily, it's transportation of the Snake River, Snake River to Lewiston, uh, Idaho, and some irrigation didn't like that, said this was advocacy, and so puts in appropriations bill, eliminate the Fish Passage Center, because this is not the kind of information that we think is. Now, in fairness, he said, well, we'll just, that task will go to other agencies, but you can imagine the message that this was sending. Now, as it turns out, through litigation and some creative statutory interpretation, the center gets saved, um, but it's an example of how if you start making agencies really small, they become vulnerable. So I don't have an easy solution on prioritizing among monitoring programs. I think that's an important question. In fact, uh, you know that could be another step of what you're looking at it uh, and how you decide that. There is, in, in, to some extent, there is uh, is literature on this, right? So. Uh, most of the monitoring literature is all scientific, technical. How do you measure this particular resource with this particular technique in this context? But there, the, there is some literature about optimal monitoring uh, by some economists and scientists of, you know, how do we assess what the costs and benefits of monitoring? Would monitoring be worth it or not in this context? And that could be applied not just to the problem of monitoring per se, but also to trying to decide how to monitor across programs. But the challenge is, as I said, that if it's hard to assess how good your monitoring program is, it's going to be really hard to assess whether program A, monitoring program A, is that much better than program B, and therefore it deserves more money. Well, and just kind of as a piggyback, would it possibly make sense to, rather than have an agency that, that is solely focused on monitoring, try to somehow create a, a public-private partnership where all the data that is already being monitored, kind of as Sherry was saying, is brought together under one roof, and then maybe the focus of the agency is sifting through the data rather than creating it on its own? So you could, uh, if I take the question, sort of maybe creating agencies whose job is to analyze monitoring and, and overcome. So I think that could be important, too, and helpful, too. Um, I don't know if it solves all the problems, so that might you know, push the step along further. We've collected the data, now someone analyzes it, but you still might get a report that gathers dust on a shelf, right? And there are also advantages to coordinating your analysis with manage management and regulatory decisions, right? So you could throw all the analyses you want up against a wall that doesn't tell you which ones are the most useful and which ones are the most helpful. So there's actually a fascinating study paper um, out there that shows the exact same data, you take five different statistical techniques and you get five different conclusions about what trend you have. And there's no a priori reason why you would choose one or the other of the statistical techniques. But that's where actually communicating with the people who are making decisions and the stakeholders involved, they can give you a sense of what are their risks they're concerned about, right? And 
and what are their goals in making decisions that might help you assess which analytic techniques are useful. So um, as I actually, when I've gotten to this problem of, of use of data, I do think there's some room for expanding what agencies, these separate agencies could do. They might do analysis. They might even make recommendations about how the data should be used. Um, the challenge, of course, is you still have these coordination problems, and I think they're intractable, and really you're coming up with sort of your first, you know, your second best solution in the end between interfering, you know, making the decision-making process more complicated and more time-consuming versus getting better data and analysis of that data, and it's more likely to be used. There's no uh, simple, I think it's, again, a context-dependent solution. Other questions? JD? Um, so it's been a while since I've read this paper, uh, so you may have dealt with this. You, you can borrow the copy if you want. Okay, <laughs> um, I'm having a hard time seeing how the USGS model, and it, it's a very successful science agency that generates lots of very useful data, how we take that and map it onto adaptive management. Most of the monitoring that the USGS does is not, uh, it's not a specific uh, management purpose. Right. It's not designed to inform a specific management problem. It's stream uh, flow monitoring, it's geologic monitoring. Adaptive management context, an agency, let's say the Forest Service, has a particular forest that right. they have management objectives. <clears throat> and, you know, short of having the U.S. National Monitoring Agency assign personnel into that forest the expertise about well, what are your management objectives, what are the right indicator species, etc., and then go about uh, applying their monitoring skills, directly feeding them right into that adaptive management program. Um, and, and so I don't see how it would work other than that, and then have we functionally really done anything different from what we have right now, where, you know, USDA has its own data uh, monitoring service, division for service, already have right. monitor, monitoring uh, employees with monitoring skills who are employed in the staff and national contracts. So uh, there is an example of that, so uh, at least one, and I know it because it's one of the case studies I've been looking at in detail, which is the Glen Canyon, US, the Glen, uh, Grand Canyon uh, Monitoring Research Center, GCMRC, is a USGS entity that then operates under contract with Bureau of Reclamation, which operates the upstream dam plus the Park Service and Fish and Wildlife Service, which uh, care about the downstream resources. So then the question is, what utility or what advantage is that getting for us? So in the GCMRC case, I think generally um, a couple of things. One I didn't mention to in this talk, but there's a perception the institutional separation has another political benefit, which it means the information can be perceived as unbiased or at least less biased and therefore more trustworthy. And actually, I want to highlight Kevin's point about trust being essential. Although I would broaden it just not just the trust between the regulated party and the agency, but the trust of the public or at least the important stakeholders. And if you don't have trust in data, in monitoring data, particularly because it's so opaque, right, that can mean that it can never persuade anyone. Right? Because no one, if I don't trust you, but I don't really understand what you're doing, why would I go along with it? So I think the advantage of GCMRC has been partly creating tr what's perceived as trustworthy data by all the various parties. The other benefit of it is that they report to different people. So yes, it's true that Bureau of Reclamation could cut off the funding to GCMRC, although there'd be huge political costs for them to do so. But more generally, they're part of a different agency with a different culture. They report to different people. You know, the, the Bureau of Rec's tools are pretty blunt. They can't go in and try to ask particular scientists to be terminated or reassigned or whatever. So it creates an institutional separation that's useful. Now, that could happen within the Forest Service, and I think this is where you were going in part, which is you could create stovepipe organizations, right? So they don't report, they report directly to the chief or directly to the assistant secretary level rather than reporting to the individual forest, right? And the, the actually example you might point to this is the. Um, the Forest Service's research branch, which has historically been s quite separate from the management branch of the Forest Service. Um, and that can provide some of these same benefits while reducing some of the coordination problems that we've talked about. So one thing to keep in mind when I talk about separate agencies, and in fairness to everyone, this is in a paragraph or a footnote in a 75-page article, so why would you remember it? You don't just look at the org chart. You have to actually think in practical terms who controls the budget, who controls personnel, who controls tasks that are given to personnel, who controls the, the, the design of the monitoring programs and what's done with them. 
and uh, that can be uh, a separate organization within an institution, you know, a sub-agency can be in practice very independent and autonomous. And a separate organization can be actually quite subservient and problematic. So actually, again, it's not in this one I've been looking at as a follow-on case study, ATSDR, the uh, Agency for Toxic Substance Disease and Registry, which does a lot of follow-up on Superfund cleanup sites. It's a, got a terrible reputation, which I can't speak to whether it's really deserved or not, because I can't go through all the ATSDR reports and be better than the epidemiologists assessing it. But it's, I know it's got a terrible reputation. It's technically independent. It's a sub-agency within CDC, which is itself an independent branch of HHS. But the problem is, for many years, its budget was determined by EPA and CDC. And in particular, EPA had no desire, argue, well, there's good evidence EPA didn't have much of a desire for ATSDR to succeed. Because all AD, you know, ATSDR goes in and maybe says, EPA, your cleanup plan doesn't work well. Well, EPA is not going to be so thrilled about that necessarily, right? And it's competition. Right? So I agree with you. You don't just have to look at particular org charts to see whether it's independent and how independent it is. And independence is a matter of degree. But the, what I liked about USGS is it is really independent. It's part of Interior, but it's got a long history. It's hard to mess with it. It survived the mid-90s, all the budget cuts and everything, which was a hard time for some agencies in that area to survive. Uh, it does do a lot of long-term baseline monitoring, and I hear what you're saying about the need to tailor it to particular circumstances, but a lot of that data can still be useful, particularly for designing adaptive management programs and providing the broader context that you use to focus what you particularly need, but you rely on that broader monitoring data to shape how you structure your program. And really high prestige, relatively high prestige for a government agency, relatively perceived as unbiased, and they've done a good job of keeping their budget going. I actually uh, have some data in that in the, in the article here about how they've been able to moderate their monitoring data better than EPA has, and the subcomponent of EPA's monitoring budget over the years. Um, and then they've done this contracting out thing where they've basically gone to agencies and said, hey, we'll do work for you. Uh, we'll provide the monitoring data. You get us the mon money. And we can do sort of partnerships that way. And that deals with some of the collaboration problems and the tailoring. Of course, the more that happens, you can argue maybe that undermines USGS's independence over time. So we'll see how that works. But, but if nothing else, just thinking about it this way is something that people have not been doing. And that's you need to think about these things this way in order to really understand whether you're actually going to be producing good monitoring data. <coughs> Any other questions? LPAR students, don't be shy. Um, this is uh, more for you, Kevin. Um, you're talking about how in Canada that the, the corporation does a fair amount more monitoring than it does in the U.S. I guess this is uh, for the states also. So, first of all, do you find that the company gets business benefits from doing that monitoring? And then maybe for you after that, if private company data was available to the SELC, is that something that it would find? useful in constructing its plans? Because I know you were talking about how you sometimes have a lack of data and that if you had something, it would provide you benefit. So I guess that's kind of my two-part question. Um, so it's interesting. I mentioned this in, in, in my um, comments. We're often monitoring to prove a lack of an impact. And so, and we've been doing this in some facilities for almost 20 years now. And we continue to do it even, and continue to demonstrate lack of impact. That information is priceless, essentially, when we go to modify a process, add something different. You know, we want to expand, whatever the case may be. We've got information available that we can use in our discussions with the regulatory agency, with the community, and say, look, we've got this monitoring data, these monitoring data. We've been doing this for 20 years. Of course, it's all a program that we've all agreed on with all stakeholders. We've got that information. We can build on that. We can use that to continue forward. We've got trend data. So in that way, it does provide a lot of business value. Um, it was, certainly, we maintain community relations. But you know, once you build a $100, $150 million facility, it's not like you're going to pick up and go. So I mean, it's, it's really more for, from a business side. That's where we find the value in that. Well, and um, I would say, depending on the level of trust and the relationship you had with, with the company that was providing the data, yeah, that could, you could get that data and say there's no problem here. 
Um, for example, with fracking, there are three universities recently have put out studies saying there's no uh, adverse impacts on the environment for fracking. Those three studies were all funded by oil and gas companies, and they've all recently been discredited um, just because of, I don't know the details, but you know, one would think that the uh, financing and the incentives to find no impacts. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it can be very helpful. Um, but again, you've got to look at the source and make sure what, what the trustworthiness is. Okay, any last question? Yeah, yeah from Professor Bieber. So it seems like you have a cost-benefit analysis between having an independent agency in the one hand that would be very costly, uh, or having kind of corporations doing it on their own, and it would be, you would have a, a higher potential for bias. Um, but it would be cheaper, and most importantly, I feel like they would have more expertise. So that cost-benefit analysis doesn't seem all that clear to me, and, and especially the expertise part, I feel like we might be undervaluing that a little bit in that balancing. So I, uh, I agree that's a, one of the trade-offs here. I mean, I thought you were going to go with the separate versus combined agencies, and that's one trade-off on a cost-benefit analysis. But another one is public monitoring directly, having public agencies do the monitoring directly versus having private parties do the monitoring themselves. And so I, first, would the private parties do it cheaper themselves? Unless you think, I mean, you might think private entities operate on average more cheaply than public entities, and that might be. But otherwise, simply because it's not a public budget expense doesn't mean it's not a social cost, right? The resources are social resources that are being used. So unless you think private entities operate on average more efficiently than public entities, and, and that, there, that may well be, there's, no, there's not a cost savings there. Now, on the expertise, I think that's context dependent. Um, some circumstances, the industry is going to have expertise and others not. So in particular, if it's a resource that isn't particularly relevant to the industry's business and is not core for you know, stakeholder reasons or regulatory reasons, there's no reason for them to develop the expertise on it, whereas another out, a public agency that's focused on that resource might make a big difference, might, might have a much larger expertise. So um, the other thing I would throw in there is the more, the, when you do contracting or subcontracting out, and that's basically what this is, right? You are still left with what the economists call the principal agent's problem, right? And that in which the agent might not do what the principal wants. In this case, the corporation may not monitor in the way that the public agency wants. So as Kevin noted, that means that the agency has to supervise what they're doing, which is fine, but that's an added cost as well. Now again, you might think that on average that's more than outweighed by the cost savings that have the private entity doing it themselves. But I don't think you, I agree with you to summarize, this is really hard. This is, there's no clear answer. You can say it always works one way or always works the other way. Um, and that's sort of how I come out in the paper in general. But what I think it is important is you understand what these factors are and that you're trading off on them so that you can go in and make an informed judgment. You know what things to think about in any particular context. You know that this is a problem to begin with and you know that you need to address it and then you know what factors are going to be helpful in you thinking about how to address it. And then you might come to different answers in different contexts depending on the particular natures of the politics, the economics, the ecology, the social, the social context in that particular problem. Well, oh, all right, gotcha. Um, Professor Bieber, so information is really important with climate change, mm -hmm. figuring out how we're going to deal with it. Um, but when it comes to actual climate change, as in CO2 equivalent in the atmosphere, um, and the carbon <coughs> isn't so important because you know, it's, it's something, I mean, we don't need to monitor CO2 concentration everywhere. Right. Um, so, might that be a challenge politically? You're pushing for more ambient monitoring. People say, yeah, well, this is assuming people care about climate change or believe in it. Uh, but they say, yeah, but all we need is one place on um, a mountain in Hawaii to monitor CO2. We don't need to. That's the most important thing. Um, why worry about ambient monitoring? So the nature of the scale that you need to monitor at depends on the resource, right? And temp monitoring on a broad geographic scale doesn't mean that you have to monitor on a broad temporal scale or vice versa. So you're right, they only needed one site in Mauna Kea, uh, uh, but they needed to monitor for 30 years to actually detect the trends, right? Because if you look at the chart, it's a really cool chart, 
there's a high annual variability in CO2 because uh, it's dominated by the northern hemisphere and temperate norm, northern hemisphere. There's also a decadal cycle that's related to El Nino events. And it's only after you've seen a couple of those cycles that you can detect the overall secular increase due to human emissions. So it needed to be done for decades. And there's, a, you know, if you read the story by the scientists who ran this, he got cut off by various funding agencies, government funding agencies over the years because he wasn't doing real science. I mean, the NSF cuts him off after eight or 10 years. He said, okay, you've established that you can measure CO2 levels from this one site on the global level, whatever. Like, we're done with that. And he's like, no, no, no. Like, I, this is a priceless data set. Who, getting to JB's question, you know, who knows what this could be useful for? And it turns out it was incredibly useful. And so we had to scrimp and save and get the budgets to keep doing the data over the years. It's an amazing story. So then, then let me get to the specifics of your question, which was, well, there's an easy answer to that, which is, well, we actually don't care. I mean, it's not like it's the levels of CO2 in the atmosphere are going to asphyxiate us. That's not the problem. The problem is what that does to the biological systems that we depend on, right? So, and you need, you, we don't know how those are going to respond, and that's going to be highly contingent in time and place. And that's hugely expensive and expansive monitoring, right? So I don't think that's, I, I think if people are on board that climate change is a problem, I don't think it's hard to persuade them that there's a lot of things you would need to monitor associated with it if you were worried about adaptation to climate change. Great. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming. I especially want to thank Professor Bieber. I think this work is really important, and I think that we'll be hearing more and more about monitoring. Um, in the coming years because of your work. And thank you very much, Kevin and Sherry, and Kevin, especially the two of you who came on a day off from work. So please join me in thanking you. <laughs>